Hello everyone, this is Zach here and welcome to my channel. Today I'd like to share my final review of the Tavern DLC as well as some tips based on things I've learned along the way. So without further ado, let's get things started. So when we first received an offer to purchase a tavern in Stromkamp, we decided to call it the Haida. And we are now a 5 star rated tavern awarded by the Tavern Keepers Guild. Now every star we received, we actually received a reward from the guild. And the first reward we received was a cat. And this cat prevents rat infestations, which is awesome, increases comfort, and also increases sale odds, which is great. We also received other rewards as we ranked up, so to speak, including this weapon display, which was awesome. I could display all my legendary weapons that I collected throughout the region. Since I only use sorties or swordsmen, I was able to display all these because I don't use any of these weapons. In terms of rewards, we have unlocked all 13 rewards. So we have 14 factions and each faction gives you a reward with the exception of bandits because they're cheap. So 14 factions, but 13 rewards. And the rewards we received are things like, let me just find it, a couch, a guest book, a lot of armor stands, seven in total, seven different armor stands, and a shark head, Gossenberg wheel or Gusenberg wheel, depending which NPC you speak to, they have different pronunciation. Tapestry. And two skulls, a gold skull and a stag skull. Now these skulls actually are from the same faction. It's kind of a two for one reward. So if you want to think about it, even though there are 13 rewards here, you kind of get 14 items to place all around your tavern, which is pretty cool. Now, in terms of location, we mentioned that we receive an offer to start in Tiltron and specifically strong cup so that's where we started and then once you receive a certain level of prestige you will receive an offer to move to marheim and then finally you get the final location which is in grinmere in terms of specialties we've actually unlocked because we've kind of unlocked everything we've unlocked all the five specialties for the tavern in terms of food so you've got alchemist creme brulee north country ratatouille lake fish bouillabaisse Swamp Bourguignon, and Cheesy Macaron. Now my personal favorite in the game is Lakefish Brew Beast. The reason is because I mostly play with sorties. And if you have a look at my Unstoppable Swordsman guide, this skill, the well-fed skill, complements that build very, very well. So the skill is basically that each time this unit performs an attack, they gain one rage. And rage is an increase in damage by 5%. In my Swordsman build, each swordsman can actually attack at least four to five times at least. That means within one turn, they can increase the damage by, at a minimum, 20 to 25%. So it's really, really complimentary. I really, really like it. If you want to check out the guide, I'll, I put the link in the description below. So feel free to check it out and let me know. Now back to our tavern. Just want to cover a couple more things to show you where we're at. Our profits. Currently averaging about 3,000, I think is where we're going to land. It was low at about 2,000 copper coins. The reason was I was trying to attract a specific clientele and that clientele or faction uh, didn't want to pay high prices for their food or drinks. So I had to lower it and therefore lower profitability. But since I received their reward, I've just been increasing prices to a point where I'm generating quite a healthy profit. I suspect you'll probably stay around the three to 3,000 to 3.5,000 copper coins in the next few ships. In number of patrons, 92. We can actually sit 96, but we actually have four thieves. Batman, Thor, Professor Xavier, and Captain Marvel. So they actually take up spots that patrons would have otherwise taken. So that's why it's 92 up here, as you can see. We also did receive some random rewards. So sometimes a patron would come in and they have a question mark on top of them, or they want to interact with you. And they will give things like, oh, a harp. So I think we received this from a very loyal customer. We also received a portrait right here. Portrait of Solvius, the great solverizer. And also a gaming table. This one. Ifrion game. So pretty cool to get random rewards. I don't know what other random rewards we might get, so we'll see. But so far I've received three. In terms of the exchange rate. So the lowest I've gone to, because we have hundred over thousand copper coins uh, I've actually saved up a lot 
I decided, oh, let's try to see how low that goes. And the lowest it's gone to is 20 crowns for 100 copper coins. So it seems low, but as I'll cover later in this video, it's not too bad once you generate a healthy enough profit per shift. Finally, just want to go through the staff members that I have. Still one tavern keeper, still the same person from the beginning. We have four scullions or four cooks, seven different brewers, three bards, again, all superheroes that I caught, except for Santos, doesn't count, Black Panther and Hulk. And then we have nine bouncers, including, including our special pig. We also have, as I mentioned, four thieves just to help steal, but really they're prisoners that I have captured and or superheroes that I've captured and placed them to work in my tavern. So that's where we're at with our tavern. This is where we landed. I'm sure we'll keep progressing it, but I don't think there's anything else we can do to grow it. So let's move on to the next section, which is things that I've learned. The first tip I'd like to share based on my experience playing the Tavern DLC in season two of my playthrough is around staffing. There are two types of staff. One are civilians, represented the icon where you have see a number of people. Their profession can't be changed. Whatever you hire them for is the profession that they'll be stuck with. So Winion was hired as a brewer, she is stuck with as being a brewer. A non-civilian, however, you can change the profession to any of the 11 professions you want. However, for a tavern, the only relevant professions are a thief, a brewer, and a cook. So I could easily reassign Captain Marvel to be one of those, and that will be perfectly fine. The other thing you might have noticed is I have four prisoners here working in my tavern. Now, why am I doing this? Well, one, I'm trying to make it a fun gameplay in Season 2. But two, I found out that if I assign prisoners into my tavern, they, act, they never run away. Unlike in camp, Unless you assign them to the stocks, if they're sitting anywhere else or working on any of your items, producing things, they potentially could run away. And I've had that happen throughout the season. But in the tavern, once I've sent them in, they never ever run away. So that for me is a great perk because I don't have to wait, uh, let's say for a civilian with the right uh, profession or the right skills, whatever the case may be. And also for making this a fun gameplay where I put superheroes working for me in the tavern who are actually my prisoners. The only drawback though you just have to be mindful of is as a prisoner when you hover over the prisoner the specialty they bring is minus five prestige for each shift. So I have four prisoners that's minus 20. Now I'm, pl I'm pretty much late in the game when it comes to the tavern DLC so it's not really having an effect on my prestige. Early game it might have a bit of an impact depending how many prisoners you have. However, over time, you can get access to artifacts, rewards, furniture that help you negate that. So for example, this improved tavern loot grants five prestige each shift. So if I had four of them, that would negate the negative prestige that the prisoners would bring. So it's a non-issue. The second last thing I'd like to share with you is you can actually assign animals to work in your tavern. However, they can only work as bouncers. And you see here as I scroll down, I have the pig, the bouncer. So he, his specialty is a mascot and he increases sale odds by 15% for all patrons in the area. Plus he also gains five copper coins every shift pretty much. So you can do that. They can't be assigned to any other uh, profession. So if I show you that as unassigned pig and the only option is to assign him as a bouncer. It makes sense because he can't really steal. They don't have hands nor can they play instruments. I mean, I'd be surprised if they could nor can they cook or brew things nor should they be a tavern keeper. So you definitely can do that, should you wish to. And the last thing I'd like to share, which I found out quite late, it's probably my fault for not reading things properly, is when you hover over any of um, the civilians or non-civilian icons, if you press on shift, you can look at all the details of all the other jobs they can undertake in your tavern. So Captain Marvel can be a tavern keeper, a thief, or a bouncer. And it would show you all the specialties and effects that they would have in each role. Now, Captain Marvel could also technically work as a cook and a brewer, it, and it's not showing these. That's because her currently assigned profession is a thief, so it only shows a thief. If you want to show her effects as a cook, just change her to a cook, hover over her icon and shift, and now you have the cook details and not the thief details. So that's it in terms of staffing that I'd like to share in terms of what I've learned. 
So the next tip I'd like to share is around the menu and the seller. So I, again, I realized it a bit lately, but the prices, you don't just have to adjust down, you can also adjust upwards. So let's say, let me just get rid of all these dishes for a moment for argument's sake. If I were to add cabbage perch, I don't have to stay with 34. You'll see that if I increase it to 35, the sale lots is still 100%. Keep going up and up and up. So what I would normally do is increase it to the point where, okay, it starts dropping and I just decrease it. And I run a pretty healthy profit because of that, rather than accepting the default price. Now, early in game, you might struggle to get a good sale odd. So it might be, for example, 90%. So to increase your patronage, you might want to drop the price to get more people into your tavern. So why am I able to increase it beyond the default normal price? Well, that's because if I hover over here, you can see my capacity is 93. And I welcomed 92 yesterday. So it's changing because I reassigned the thief. But patrons turn away, I had to turn away 31. So I have excess demand for my food in my tavern as well as my alcoholic beverages. So that's why I can and I should adjust my prices up. That way I generate more profit, which I can then turn into either improving my tavern or withdrawing the copper coins into ground so that I can use it in the real world. The other thing I'd like to share is with your seller. So what I found and I really like is if you age your alcoholic beverages, you sell for a higher price. So let me give you an example. So let's use cider. Okay, I have aged it. It has two star ratings and I can sell it for generally if you look at um, this icon, the top one, it's 10. Ignore the 13 because that's me just increasing the price. So generally it's 10 copper coins. If you look just next to the title of cider, it's 10 copper coins. If I were to change, this is a non H barrel. Okay, if I were to change this to cider as well, you will see that instead of 10, it's default is six. So there is a four copper coin differential and that's massive. So that's like 66% increase in just the sale price itself. So I found that pretty useful. Now, the only drawback is if you want to attract the guard, they will only appear if it's cheap food. So the maximum price you can offer is five copper coins. So obviously with the cider, aging it, I can still offer it at five. It's not an issue, but I make a huge loss. It's better for me to then open up another barrel, non-aged, and just have the cider. Default price would have been six. I'm just reducing it to five. While still maintaining this, because some people still want the aged cider, and I can sell it for a much higher price and a much higher profit margin. So about 13. So the margin is about 11 per cider. And the last final thing is with the menu. I wanted to cook early in the game. I wanted to cook some of these feasts, Hill Delights, Broker Table, King's Feast. And I was very curious about this alcoholic beverage because each of them, aside from requiring you, for example, to have if you read in the red font, beer infused wolf ribs and candied fruit. That's probably not a good example. Let me choose Hill Delights. It says I need eel soup, apple pancake, as well as Gossenberg wine. And I was very curious. Okay, so how, how do I find Gossenberg wine? It's not on the list of uh, ingredients. Does that mean it's a, a region specialty? I belatedly realize actually I need to produce the drink or the alcohol beverage in my cellar in order for it to complete the feast, so to speak. So in this case, I can cook the tail of the wolf and hop, right? Because if I hover this, the only thing I need to prepare this dish is beer infused wolf ribs and candied fruit. It doesn't require me to have beer. That's because in my cellar, I'm already producing beer. So I hope that helps you in your menu, determining your menu, making some adjustments, but also some tips around how to match your, your alcoholic beverages within your cellar. Finally, the last few tips I like to share are just general in nature. And the first one is the fact that you can get random rewards from patrons. I've received three so far. The first one is a harp. It attracts upscale patrons, increases every bard's area effect by 25%. The second one is an inherent game allows the tavern to welcome two patrons per shift, increases comfort by six, increases sale loss by 15%, but it reduces security by three and it attracts working class patrons. Not very different to the gaming table, but it does provide extra comfort by three, although it reduces security by three as well. 
And lastly, the last random reward I received was the portrait of Solvius the Great Solverizer, and that increases comfort by 10. So it's actually quite a nice element to have that you never know who's going to turn in your, in your tavern as a patron, and they can give you random rewards like this. The next tip I'd like to share is around the exchange rate. Now, earlier in this video, you would have noticed me mentioning that the lowest I could go down to in terms of exchange rate is 100 copper coins for 20 crowns. So if I keep withdrawing, that's the lowest exchange rate. So that seems pretty low and doesn't seem like a lot. However, I'm expecting my profits to be about 3 to 3.3 thousand copper coins every shift. That equates to about 600 crowns per shift. And that's not too bad. If I go back out into my camp, you'll see here that I only have to pay wages every three rests. So that's because I'm playing on expert difficulty, and I think if your survival difficulty is experienced, it's probably four rests. You pay wages every four rests. So for me, on this playthrough, it's every three rests, and the wages that I have to pay is around 600 crowns. So one shift earns me enough to pay the wages for three rests. But after three rests, because I earn 600 crowns per shift, which is one rest, that's 1,800 crowns. Less the wages I have to pay, 600. So net total, I still make 1,200 crowns, which is pretty good. Now that's obviously assuming I don't take advantage of this new shift function, which I can then spend influence points to ask for a new shift to be run in the tavern without resting. So I could do that as well and earn an extra 600 crowns. So it's actually quite profitable. And it does quite translate into a good way to earn extra crowns without having to do bounties necessarily if you want to focus on the main quests or the side quests. And it's not too hard to build up a good copper coin balance. As you can see, I'm at 122,000 copper coins. Now I haven't used the new shift. I think I've only used it once, but I haven't really used it. I've only gone up to 134 shifts. Seems like a lot, but I guess in the real world, in War Tales, you're actually resting quite a bit as well because you do get fatigued and you battle a lot. So I have built up quite a healthy balance. So that's actually pretty good. And I wouldn't mind that. That's actually not too bad. The other thing I'd like to share is I think the tavern is a great place to level up your thieves. So if you have someone with a thief profession, I find it quite hard uh, sometimes unless you're always stealing. And then when you always steal, you increase your wanted level and you either get chased around or if you don't like getting chased, you then get caught, you send someone to jail and then you have to go and grab them again. That's quite you know, annoying sometimes, repetitive and grindy. You can actually place them in the tavern, they will level up and they level up quite fast. So Batman is already a master thief and he's only level nine. So I caught him at level nine compared to the level of my companions. So Carnage is only level 11, right? So they do level quite fast. The only problem is in the tavern, their individual le level doesn't actually increase. So he's stuck at nine. So there are benefits, pros and cons, I guess, with doing that. But I found that they do level up faster, especially a brewer. So I have leveled up Lex as a brewer in my camp, I suppose, because I do have a brewery in my camp. I found that took ages, while here it seemed to be much quicker. The other thing about the tavern, which I found really, really good, is it's a great source of food. So if I go to the menu, and if I go to my specialty, specialties are at the bottom, and my personal favorite, Lake Fish Brewer Bees. If you read the description, specialties, when a specialty is repaired at the tavern, a serving is set aside for the troop at each rest. A tavern specialty is its trademark, and only one can be served at, at a time. One kind can be served at a time. So you can obviously only select one of the five, and but whenever you select one to sell, and you do sell one in your tavern, you get one in your real world as well. So if I go back out to my real world, I'm sorry, I'm calling it real world. I'm sure there's a better term for it. And you'll see here that I have a lot of cheesy macaron and also lake fish boobies. I don't have a lot of lake fish boobies because I belatedly realized the benefits of it. So I started selling those in my tavern, but I get these for free and they feed like each one feeds 14 drumsticks. I call them drumsticks because that's food. And that's great. So every rest, I get 14 free. 
that is the equivalent of, let's say, a normal dish. So, wolf sausage, that's six. That's two of them, two and a half, or two and 33%, somewhere there. So that's a pretty good source of food as well, assuming you sell them in your tavern. Now, early in your tavern gameplay, you may not sell them because your sale lots are lower. And what you can always do is just reduce the price to get the sale lots to 100%. And then you guarantee the sale of that specialty. And then you also get a, one type of it or one item in the reward as well, which you can use to supplement your troops, your companions. In terms of clientele, one thing I found useful is when you hover, if you're trying to determine or find the rewards or obtain the rewards from each of the factions, all you have to do is just hover over them and it'll tell you what they like and don't like and when will they appear. So a noble may appear if a feast is on the menu. If you look at peasants, they're not going to appear. There's no tick mark. There's a reason for that. They only appear if there's cheap food on the menu. So a maximum that you can charge them is 11 copper coins. The guards, they only appear if there's cheap booze. Again, maximum you can charge for the booze is 5 copper coins. For sailors, they only appear if there's a fish on the menu. All right. So I don't have any fish dishes on my menu. That's why the parts, uh, sorry, the sailors aren't coming at all. You can also hover here without having to go through the tavern management. So if you're going through the menu, you can see, okay, pirates, they only appear if security is weak. So they're not appearing. They have no tick mark next to their name because my security is 100% or 100. So that's one thing you can look out for in terms of what to do uh, so that you can attract the relevant factions you want to get the relevant rewards. Now the recipes you steal from your rival taverns, I've stolen every single rival tavern's recipe. So there are two types of recipes. One is food and the other one is a brewing one. So cooking recipe and brewing recipe. Now the brewing recipe is what I found to be very useful. Whatever I steal here from the rival taverns, I can also produce it in my real world. So let me go out. And then if we go to the compendium, hot brewer, bring that. All these, aside from the ones that normally appear from just playing um, the normal game without the tavern DLC, you have others that it's because I've stolen the recipe from the rival taverns. So whiskey, absinthe, sparkling wine. And I love these because, for example, absinthe, they increase movement speed in the world by 3%. That's awesome. Plus, plus, you can also age them. All right, so I have Kirsch. Kirsch, movement speed in the world is 3%, increased by 3%. But aging them doubles that. So this is a normal Kirsch I produce from cherries. And this is the aged version. It increases movement speed by 6%. Now that's useful for me because I'm playing... My theme for Season 2 is really around being supervillains. So we're always committing crime. You can see my wanted level is always level 5 or above, and I'm wanted for a lot of things. You can see the very long list. So the guards are always chasing me. So having a very high run speed, movement speed, is really, really beneficial for me. So I really, really love that fact that I can steal recipes from rival taverns in terms of the brewing recipes and then brew it or make it in my, in my camp as well. Now, the last thing to share that I haven't unlocked myself, but just in case you didn't know, you can right click on this tavern loot and you'll see that you can unlock more songs, but you have conditions you have to meet in order to unlock them. So win a battle with only one dying unit, decimate a troop of eight or more units with a team using no equipment, have a boar called Hammy and make it kill five units in a single battle. I haven't bothered doing them because I'm just focusing on my playthrough at some point, maybe I might do them, but yeah, you, if you want more songs, you can definitely undertake these challenges. I don't know if then these would translate into your tavern. So if you go to a tavern in the real world, and you go to the tavern keeper, you can sing. I don't have a bar at the moment, but you can choose songs to sing. And the songs that you can choose at the moment are only limited to two. Or the ones that I play through are only limited to. And the two that's limited to are these two. So I'm not sure if you unlock these, you might also be able to play them in your tavern. Should you want, should you wish to, every time you go to visit a tavern in one of the towns. 
So those are the general tips that I found um, I hope are useful to you. Uh, some things I've learned later, uh, belatedly, unfortunately, because I'm not reading descriptions properly. But I hope it actually helps you in your gameplay and enjoy the tavern playthrough as well. So what do I think about the tavern DLC? Well, after having completed 134 shifts, as you can see here, having unlocked all my rewards from the factions, having received some random rewards, having achieved a 5 star rating. In terms of difficulty, I think it's pretty low. I think it's pretty easy to succeed in the tavern business within War Tales, which is good because it's meant to complement the main game, um, is what I believe is the case or purpose of the tavern DLC. So if it gets becomes too complex and becomes a business simulation on its own, then it kind of distracts people from the main purpose of War Tales, which is RPG, exploration, strategy, and battle. In terms of funness, I think it's really fun. I really enjoy it. I still enjoy it, even though there's not much I have to do or can do. I can still play around with the menu just to see how much more copper coins I can earn. In terms of gameplay, it's, it's normal. As I said, it's not meant to be a business simulation, so it's not going to be complex or hard. Um, it's neither too simple that it becomes an afterthought. At the beginning, you still get a decent amount of gameplay in setting things up. The design is great. I love the design. I love the assets. I love the ambiance. Uh, I love all the decor that you can customize, the candlesticks and everything. I, I think all that is really, really good. There are a few things though I wish we had in the Tavern DLC. Firstly is more sites and bigger sites. So I've only had three sites, um, starting in Stromkop in Tiltrin, and then moving on to Marheim in Virtus, and finally to Grimmir Province, the biggest site available. I wish there were more sites, maybe the same number of sites matching the number of regions we have. And also, I wish there were more furniture options. So pretty early on, I've unlocked all the furniture options. You do unlock the improved versions over time, but I wish there were more, more customization, I guess, to make it look a little bit different. The customization aspect, sorry, sorry to confuse you, I used it twice, but in terms of, you know, the tavern wall, tavern floor, there are not many options. I thought that we're going to, as I progress through the game and get more prestige, we'll get more of this, but very early on, you unlock this and this doesn't change. You never, ever have to come to this tab anymore unless you want to change it to attract working class instead of upscale patrons or you just want to change the color because you just feel like it like I feel like a green day so I'll be green today or teal lastly I wish I had four walls <laughs> so there are only two walls here I wish I had two more walls so I could decorate more put more portraits um, more torches just lighten up the place like this area is a little bit dark because I'm struggling for space I could put more candlesticks but I can't even swivel and have a look at see give you a different viewpoint the other thing is uh, I can't tilt this further down I can tilt it up but I want it further down the reason is I want to enjoy this wall of honor here where I've got so many rewards and, and um, artifacts here on display but this is the best I mean this is the best view can't really see everything this would be perfect but the chandeliers and the wooden beam is in the way. So those are things I wish um, could be changed or added. But all in all, I still think it's a great DLC. Is it worth the price? If you are strapped for cash or funding, I suggest just wait for a discount and then purchase it. If you want an extra distraction, side distraction, not a major distraction from your main gameplay. But if you also want something that can passively earn you food and crowns, once you convert the copper coins into crowns, go for it. I think it's very, very beneficial from that aspect. So that's it for my tips and review video. I hope you enjoyed. If you do find it useful, please do like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. And until next time, take care. Have a great day. Bye.